listen, I know what you're thinking. This bitch is filming after she just washed her hair again. And yes, I am because I'm not good at planning. So for this video, I wanted to talk about a rom-com that I love and also talk about how it kind of killed the Manic Pixie Dream Girl trope. I just wanted to pop in and say thank you to everyone who watched my Winx Club video and decided to also watch my other videos. That's so nice of you. Um, yeah. If you've consumed basically any form of media in the past 10 years, you probably know what a Manic Pixie Dream Girl is. Any girl in a movie that you see and think, oh wow, I need a girl like that or OMG, she's so quirky, she's totally me. I, I make a noise or I do something that no one has ever done before and then I can feel unique again even if it's only for like a second. Or I bet Zoe Deschanel's bills are paid. They're mostly featured in works by sensitive guys who can never really catch a break, whether it be in love or life or work, a pretty quirky girl will sweep into his life and teach him to see the bright side of things. She lives in a childlike world of possibilities and optimism, her head so far up in the clouds that it doesn't seem that her feet will ever touch the ground. She's bright and happy and full of a love for life that seems almost alien to the male lead and even to you as the viewer. How can anyone possibly be so in love with life? She's beautiful, but not too beautiful as to be unapproachable. She doesn't exactly have a complete grasp of social etiquette, but she's friendly enough that most people don't seem to care. She's honestly a spectacle to behold, both by you as the audience and the male lead, who inevitably falls in love with her, changing his life for the better in the process. This trope has been criticized for being sexist, which is fair. It reduces female characters to a vehicle for male characters' development without any exploration of a deeper internal life for themselves. Actually, in recent years, some people have said that the criticism for the trope has arguably been more widespread than the trope itself. Aisha Harris and Slate wrote, quote, Famous examples including Natalie Portman in Garden State, Kate Hudson in Almost Famous, and Zoe Deschanel in Everything. You may have noticed, though, that the more recent of those two films is nearly a decade old. And that, having moved her quirk to the small screen with New Girl, Deschanel hasn't done much lately for the Manic Pixie Dream Girl's big screen legacy. She may even have tired of such roles. Earlier this year, she said, When you get sent scripts and you see you're always playing someone's girlfriend when you want to be the central role, it's so depressing. Unquote. And this article was published in 2012, so I feel like the Manic Pixie Dream Girl has been on its way out, and maybe it's not as prevalent anymore but I think it's still worth looking at as a cultural phenomenon. More importantly, what I want to talk about is works that went beyond the trope and explored the interior lives of these girls, these Manic Pixie Dream Girls, who I will be shortening to Dream Girls because Manic Pixie Dream Girls is kind of a mouthful. What happens to these Dream Girls after the man has learned to love? After she's used her bright smiles and quirky characteristics to pick up the broken pieces of the male lead's life and put him back together again? Jub We Met is a 2007 rom-com starring Shahid Kapoor and Karina Kapoor. No relation. Aditya Kashyap, a depressed businessman who has lost his father, his girlfriend, and with a failing company to manage, Literally as I was making this video, I realized that Jub We Met is basically a knockoff of Elizabeth Town starring Kirsten Dunst. Like that's crazy. I mean, except for the second half, which is the part where they kill the pic Manic Pixie Dream Girl thing, but it, it literally is just a ripoff of that. Like I'm, that's insane. I can't believe I didn't see that. Well, actually I didn't watch Elizabeth Town, so I guess it makes sense that I didn't see that, but. Wanders Mumbai aimlessly as he contemplates taking his own life. He eventually finds his way onto a departing train, and it's on this train that he meets Geet. Geet is loud, nosy, and obnoxious, rambling on at Aditya even though it's pretty clear that the guy is miserable. Aditya eventually is like, I can't deal with this girl, and gets off at the next stop, probably intending to continue his directionless wandering. On a related note, it's interesting that while he's feeling so hopeless and directionless, he boards a train, which by design can only go one of two directions, thereby setting him on a predetermined path, arguably toward Geet, but you know, 
maybe I read too much into things because I took honors English, which sucked by the way. I would not recommend taking honors English. Geet is nosy though, and when she realizes that Aditi is gone, she gets off the train to tell him that he's gonna miss it. And while being a nosy good person though, she also ends up missing the train, and then she freaks out and tells Aditya to help her catch it since I missed it because I was sticking my nose in your business, so this is all your fault. So then Aditya hijacks a guy's taxi and then drives them like a maniac toward the next station so that they can beat the train and she can get back on. They arrive just as the train is pulling up and Aditya tells her this time, hey, I'm done, okay? I'm not getting back on the train, so don't look for me. And Geeth is like, haha, okay. And then while she's arguing with a vendor at the station, misses the train again. It honestly gave me flashbacks to that one episode of Spongebob. You know the one. Anyway, she goes to the station office to get her luggage situation taken care of, but then a bunch of pervy dudes at the station give her like a hard time. So she runs off where another guy outside the station mistakes her for a sex worker and then like chases her until she runs straight into Aditya, who understandably is like, what the hell, you missed your train again? And then she tells him none of this would have happened in the first place if she wasn't trying to help him out. So he's gonna have to escort her to her hometown because it's dangerous to travel alone as a girl, as we've all seen. He agrees mostly because he's too exhausted to fight it. And this part is important because typically the man in a dream girl narrative is an unwilling participant to the experience. He doesn't want to hear about how great life is. He wants to wallow in how miserable his life in particular is. Anyway, they then get into a series of ridiculous events, including accidentally checking into a love hotel. Classic. When Aditya tells Geet that his girlfriend left him to get married to another man, she does another prime manic pixie dream girl move when she tells him to burn his ex-girlfriend's photo and flush it down the toilet to get her off his mind. which he does after her nagging, and then he admits that he does feel better. This move is also important because it lays the foundations for the all-important love that the male lead must develop toward the dream girl that is always tinged with a ray of hopeless romanticism. And it's achieved through little gestures like this. Hopeless romanticism because she tells him that she has a boyfriend waiting for her back in her college town, Anshuman, and that she plans on eloping with him because her parents wouldn't approve. Their heart's heart is interrupted when the love hotel gets raided by police, so they have to escape. There's like then a travel montage and stuff during which Aditya sings because his passion has always been music. Um, and also it's a Bollywood movie, so you need like a minimum of like five musical numbers. But I will say that the songs in this movie slap. So like I never skip any of them, even though I usually do skip the songs because like it's not worth it usually, but I would recommend listening. Anyway, so he tells her that, you know, music has always been his passion. And then he also reveals that he is Aditya Gushyap, heir to the Gushyap company and fortune. And then Geet immediately puts her foot in her mouth by bringing up the fact that his mom ran off with another man. And then Aditya is like, no, yeah, that was my mom. She was a selfish bitch, which is like honestly giving me incel vibes. And then Geet is quick to be like, no, what your mom did wasn't wrong because she was in love. And then Aditya's all pissed and he's like, that's bullshit. And then this is another important scene because here we see the walls that the male lead has erected and we'll take pleasure in seeing the manic pixie dream girl break them down with her relentless optimism and charm. Because the fact is, Aditya's already halfway in love with the girl at this point. All that's left is the realization. When they get to Geet's house, her family's very grateful. They convince Aditya to stay with them for a few days to express their gratitude. And now talking about their family, I do want to point out, um, Geet is supposed to be a Punjabi girl and not just Punjabi, but a Punjabi Sikh girl. And Bollywood is kind of infamous for being very North Indian centric and Hindu centric. And while there are a lot of Punjabi actors, Punjabi Sikhs are often portrayed very stereotypically. In her paper, The Representation of Sikhs in a Bollywood Cinema, Anjali Gera Roy writes, quote, Sikhs' positions with respect to the Indian state has been defined in relation to their willingness to be assimilated into the dominant Hindu discourse as either the sword arm of the Hindus or as dangerous secessionists 
threatening the unity of the nation state. The Sikh might be permitted to enter Hindu iconography as the embodiment of exemplary courage and valor, or be tolerated as a country bumpkin in return for allegiances to the Indian state. The post-colonial Indian state alternated between twin colonial stereotypes of Sikhs as the martial race and hardy cultivators." Unquote. Also, since I'm already talking about Punjabi farmers and stuff, I feel like this would be a good spot for me to talk about the Kisan March or the Farmers March. It's basically the biggest strike in the world right now. The Indian government passed a bunch of really unfair laws that would really hurt the farming sector of the country. So the farmers have been striking, I think since September, to get all three of the laws repealed. Um, I will put links to more information in the description and also links on how to help because I know they're taking donations and, and of certain things and even money. So yeah, that would be really nice if you could do that, you know? So usually, Punjabi Sikhs are portrayed as very loud, obnoxious, and country bumpkins. And like, I mean, I am loud and obnoxious, but it's not because I'm Punjabi or Sikh, you know? <laughs> and I'm mentioning this because I do believe that with Geet's characterization as a manic pixie dream girl, which is inherently supposed to be a little bit loopy, a little bit foolish and childlike, the decision to make her a Punjabi Sikh specifically probably took this stereotype into account. Anyway, back at home, Geet realizes that her family is planning to arrange her marriage to a childhood friend of hers, Manjeet, and she's like, oh, no way. And so while Manjeet is looking, she like pretends to be in love with Aditya to get him off her back. And then that night she sneaks into Aditya's room and she's like, hey, I'm planning on running away. And then Aditya's like, wait, don't leave me here with your family. And she's like, all right, let's go. And he's like, but then they already suspect that there's something going on between us. If we run away together, that'll just confirm their suspicion. And she's like, what do you care? You don't know any of these people. And then Aditya's like, damn, you right. I don't know any of these people. So they run off. And there are some hiccups, of course, like when Geet's cousin, Roop, sees them and informs the family. But they do end up getting away successfully. They finally arrive in Anshuman's hometown, where Geet tells Aditya to come meet him. But Aditya, now completely in love, tells her, no, that's probably not a good idea. Honestly, Shahid Kapoor is like a genius at acting like a love-struck soft boy <laughs> who like he just really has mastered that expression you know like like watching this scene no matter how many times I've watched this movie I'm just like wow he really loves her and like Geet is kind of confused because she doesn't know that Aditya is in love with her but she's like all right that's fine and then you know they have an emotional goodbye and then they go their separate ways Now back in Mumbai, the labors of Geet's manic pixie dream girl-ness is bearing fruit, and Aditya is a changed man. He's upbeat, optimistic, and not only turns the company around, he also reconciles with his mother and starts playing music again. But wait, you're asking, this is a typical manic pixie dream girl story, isn't it? Where's the subversion? Why did I watch this video up until this point? And I'm gonna tell you, it comes when Geet's family shows up at Aditya's office demanding to speak to him. They're pissed and they're like, hey, where is our daughter Geet? And Aditya is confused because the plan originally had been for Geet to get with Anshuman, get married, and then return to their house a few days later. It's that whole beg for forgiveness instead of asking for permission, you know? But it's been nine months since Geet ran away and she hasn't contacted them at all. Aditya has no idea what's going on, but he promises to bring her back home as soon as possible. He packs up and then goes back to Anshuman's hometown where he left Geet nine months ago and meets up with Anshuman and asks, hey, what's going on? And <laughs> Anshuman is a, in a classic fuckboy move, is like, who? Um, so after talking, Anshuman tells Aditya he never planned to marry Geet and that was all her own delusions. And I think this is where the veneer of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl begins to crack. Uh, Anshuman explicitly tells Aditya that Geet was foolish to even think she could do this, that she lives in a childish fantasy world where nothing bad ever happens. And he even told her that she should just go home. <sighs> now, this part really sucks because as much as we hate Anshuman, and don't get me wrong, the guy is a dick, he's also kind of right. <laughs> he said that he never brought up marriage to Geet and that he never told her that they were going to elope. 
Though I guess it is up to the audience as to how much that is the truth. Because we only have ever have his word to go off of. But basically what the audience sees from this exchange is that Geeth made the decision to run away from home and try and elope with her boyfriend. And she should have to bear the consequences of her actions. The scene demonstrates the real world ramifications of living like your life is some kind of game to play with. Aditya goes off to find her and then he ends up finding her teaching at the old school that she used to attend and it's a sorry sight. Gone are her colorful clothes and jewelry and bright red nails. Now she's a washed out color palette of pastels but mostly whites. He talks to her, you know, to be like, hey, your family's really worried, you should come home. And something I liked about this exchange is that Geet, in like a fit of anger, tells him, hey, just because this is all happening to me doesn't mean it's your chance to get with me right now, okay? And like, I liked this specifically because, I mean, I guess maybe you might think that she's being too harsh, but... This is probably what the audience was thinking, right? Like, Geet was rejected, now Aditya finds her and saves her, and they live happily ever after. But that again completely disregards Geet's agency in the situation. She's not just a trophy to be handed off to the runner-up, and she's not a manic pixie dream girl. She's a girl who was in love, and she had some immature notions about how life should be. That, do that doesn't make her a trope or a stereotype. That just makes her human. I won't go into too much detail about the ending of the movie because I think it'll be more fun for you to watch it for yourself and see how it goes. But I'd also like to talk about how the subversion here kind of falls short. Like, even though Geeth has a more complex narrative than just being a muse for a depressed businessman, the majority of her narrative does revolve around the men in her life. She doesn't go home for nine months because she's so distraught from a rejection. And although part of this is heavily implied to be because she's so ashamed of betraying her family's trust for nothing, it doesn't make sense to me that someone who loved her family so much wouldn't even give them the call to tell them that she's okay. Also, some critiques of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl trope have pointed out how the term, instead of being used as a lens through which to criticize sexist portrayals of women in media, has just become a way of pigeonholing women into certain roles. It has the unintended consequence of reducing characters who may in fact be complex and possess an interior life beyond the men in her life to a bland, one-dimensional caricature despite evidence to the contrary. Like, it's not like weird girls don't exist in real life, and they're not being quirky to fit the manic pixie dream girl mold. I guess it just kind of boils down to women being people. <laughs> in fact, Nathan Rabin, the writer who first coined the term in 2007, wrote an essay retracting the term altogether. He says, I'd like to take this opportunity to apologize to pop culture. I'm sorry for creating this unstoppable monster. I'd applaud an end to articles about its countless different permutations. Let's all try to write better, more nuanced, and multi-dimensional female characters. Women with rich inner lives and complicated emotions and total autonomy, who might strum ukuleles or dance in the rain even when there are no men around to marvel at their free-spiritedness. But in the meantime, Manic Pixies, it's time to put you to rest. And I think that's a great sentiment to end on. Hi again. If you're wondering if I filmed my intro clip and my outro clip at the same exact time you're right i'm just here to escort you from the video to the end card because um i get a lot of viewer drop off right here and i feel like the algorithm would like it if i kept people engaged till the very end i don't know if that actually works but we're just trying to game the system here you know like developing parasocial relationships making long videos that the algorithm likes like listen once i get to the top i rem i promise you i will make a video with all these tips if they work anyway please like and subscribe oh and if you want to be one of the first commenters on my ne next video you could also hit the bell to get like notified every time i post um, yeah, first 10 commenters will get a heart, and then after that, you'll probably also get a heart, because I'd just be handing them out like candy. Dislikes? Since I'm not monetized, you could probably dislike. I don't think it'll affect, like, I don't know what that would do, right?
any engagement is engagement. <laughs> Alright, yeah, thanks for watching.